Okay, now into our lesson tonight. Into our lesson. <clears throat> it is uh, unusual in a sense, but we know that the Bible <clears throat> tells us that we are to be diligent to present ourselves a workman that does not need to be ashamed. And what is that workman doing? He's rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And we know, therefore, there's a way of wrongly dividing the word of truth. So we must be diligent in our efforts to be the best Bible students we can possibly be. And so it's to that end that tonight's lesson is about what it's about. And this lesson is about poetry in the Old Testament. You might think, well, that's an odd subject. Well, maybe it is in some way. But <clears throat> those of us that's been out of school for a while, or those of us that are in school, remember reading poetry in school. And we remember <clears throat> various things about poetry. Well, poetry uh, is a part or it's a style of writing that's used in, in many different cultures throughout the world. And we primarily grew up on what's called English poetry. And English poetry is, it has a very distinct style. It has to do with rhyme and it has to do with meter or rhythm. And we know about rhyming in uh, people like Shakespeare and Milton and others uh, used a, a very specific type of poetry. And that English poetry was distinguished by number one, rhyme where words at certain locations in the, po in the poem uh, sounded alike. Sing and ring. And, and those were, that was very common to come up with. Also, English poetry was characterized by, by meter or rhythm. <clears throat> you might say it was the beat of the poem. Now, the rhyme and the rhythm had nothing to do with understanding the poem or it didn't convey information about the poem. But it was how it was arranged. It was arranged to rhyme and it was arranged to have a certain beat, a certain rhythm, a certain meter. Well, Hebrew poetry is quite different because Hebrew poetry focuses on the arrangement of topics, not the arrangement of words in any sort of rhyming pattern. And this arrangement in Hebrew poetry is extremely important in understanding what is being said. And without understanding how you come to know uh, poetry in the Old Testament, you can come up with some um, wrong ideas. And so if we're truly going to be students and rightly divide the word of truth and divide it accurately... Since poetry is such a large part of the Old Testament, we must understand how it is written. And this type of writing is called parallelism. We know what the word parallel means. Well, this is a style that you find in Hebrew poetry that's characterized by it. Well, these thoughts provide information, they provide meaning, they provide understanding. So when this is written... Places like Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Job even and Song of Solomon. All of those have an abundant amount of Hebrew poetry. And if we don't know how to interpret it, we can interpret it incorrectly. It is written in a way, again, so that we can understand more fully what the author is trying to say. It's usually written in halves when we think about Parallel lines, there are two of them. Well, in Hebrew poetry, there's usually two lines. And to understand what either one of them is talking about, you have to look at them together. Otherwise, you cannot know what the author is trying to say. And again, we're going to look at examples in Psalms and Proverbs and Job, uh, a few in Ecclesiastes and a few in Song of Solomon. And that's how we're going to divide the lesson. <clears throat> and look at examples and see what understanding that, what parallelism is, helps us understand the Bible. 
And we must understand the Bible if we're going to relate to people, if we're going to teach people the truth. We've got to understand it. And so it is, you might say it's on our shoulders to spend time in knowing how to interpret, how to understand how God wrote these books because he's the author of them. God wrote Psalms, God wrote Proverbs, and he wrote them in this particular way for a particular reason. And therefore, it is uh, on our shoulders, it's our responsibility and duty to make sure we can understand what he's talking about. I'd like for us to start in the book of Psalms. We're only going to look at a few examples in each of these simply because we don't have the time. The first example comes from Psalm 2. Psalm 2. And you'll notice these parallel lines from the very beginning of this psalm. Notice verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? That's poetry. That's poetry. You know, we think about Shakespeare's sonnets, or we think about Milton's sonnets and things like that being poetry, and they are. But to the Hebrew people, what I just read was poetry. And notice the two lines. And notice how they complement one another. When you put them together, you get the author's idea of what he is trying to help us understand. He says... Why do the nations rage? So he compares the raging of the nations, or some translations have the heathen, with what the people are imagining. They're they're plotting. They're imagining a vain thing. A lot of these are about comparison. He compares these two things. And if you don't put them together, you don't get the full picture of what... uh, whether it's David or whoever, is trying to get us to understand. The next verse. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. And notice how he ends that. Against the Lord and against his anointed saying. Notice how he compares the kings of the earth and the rulers. He says, both of them are setting themselves against the Lord. They're taking counsel against God. So see how he, how he emphasizes the two, and, and often that's what poetry does. Hebrew poetry will emphasize some particular idea that he wants us to understand. Look at verse 4. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. He who sits in the heavens compared with the Lord conveys the same concept concerning God's response. There are people who plot. There are people who scheme. There are people who try to overthrow God. There were people who were doing that back in the days of David and, and, and Solomon and all the others. And there are people today who are doing the exact same thing. That's why we can get so much out of this if we take the time to to put efforts into it. People today are still trying to plot against God. They're still trying to overthrow God. Think about all the forces in our world that are trying to overthrow God. There's there's so numerous that, that there's no telling how long it would take us to talk about all the ones who are thro- trying to get rid of God. Just in the United States. Think about the organizations, the groups, the, the, the people and the societies and so forth that are trying to get rid of God. And what does God do? He laughs at them because he knows they're absolutely powerless. He laughs at them. He looks at them with derision. And so we get this picture of God when we look at all this together. We get this picture of God laughing and mocking these kings and rulers and these heathen nations who think they can get rid of God, that they can overthrow God. He laughs at them. How ridiculous, he says, they are. But this poetry is written in a way that we can remember it because it paints pictures, which is one thing poetry does so well. 
And the Hebrew poetry not only paints a picture for us and helps us to remember, but it enhances our understanding. It provides information. We learn something about God from those first four verses. We learn something about God from those. <clears throat> One more from Psalms and we're going to move on. Psalm 42. <clears throat> Notice what verse 1 says. This is a, a great instance of Hebrew poetry here. Verse 1 of Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. Now here the author, this is a figurative way of expressing one's desire for God. The first concept is a literal one. Deer panting for water. I remember this summer, my, my mom and dad had some like bird feeders and stuff like that in, in their front yard. And almost every day there'd be three deer that came to their front yard, some of you know where they live, and drink out of it. They would drink and they would just kind of mill around their front yard and then they'd leave. The next day they would come back and drink. A deer, because it was so dry this summer, they found water wherever they could find it. The author here says, this is how I feel about seeking you. Just like a deer is thirsty and is panting for water, the author says, that's how I am with you. I'm panting after you. So here, this Hebrew poetry helps us understand the author's feelings and attitude toward God. That's how much he desires God and desires the things of God. So we have a, a literal concept and a figurative one, and they correspond to one another. The book of Proverbs does this over and over again. <clears throat> In the very first chapter of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1, <clears throat> beginning in verse 13, verses 13 through 16, there's four sets of these. This is such a common thing uh, in the Old Testament. That's why it's so important that we understand how it's written. Beginning with verse 13 of Proverbs 1, <clears throat> Solomon tells us, We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our, <clears throat> our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. Now here the writer, Solomon, is instructing his son to stay away from a certain type of people. He said, son, don't be foolish, but be wise. Beware of people who say what? Who say... <clears throat> Let's go find all kinds of good stuff, prized possessions. Let's go take them and let's fill our houses with them. Let's do that. That's what these people are saying. They're trying to get this guy. He says, you know, they say, cast your lot in with us. Let us all have one purse. Let's put it all together. Sounds like they're planning a robbery, isn't it? Solomon says... Have nothing to do with them. And so here, this poetry is repeated for emphasis. Solomon is emphasizing to his son in this, don't have anything to do with these type of people. People who are constantly wanting more and more and all they want to do is get possessions and they care not how they get it. So stay away from them. And so he repeats this, and, and emphasizes to his son, watch out for these people. You hear them say these things, you hear them do these things, run the other direction. But he uses the terms and the pictures to help us remember it and then understand it better. That's what Hebrew poetry does for us. <clears throat> Over in Proverbs 10. <clears throat> it's a great example. Proverbs 10, verse 19 through 21. More uh, sayings of Solomon. Beginning in verse 19, 
In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worth little. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of wisdom. The first line here in these tells the reader to either strive for something good or avoid something bad. And you see this a lot in Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes as well, and sometimes in Job. It says, here are things to do, here are things to avoid. And they tend to be opposites. And Bible students have names for these different types, but it all comes back to those two lines. And if we only look at one of the two lines, we'll never understand what God wants us to know. And think about the phrases and the pictures, the images that are brought to our attention. Like uh, <clears throat> the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. See, we have choice silver here, which is worth a lot. Very, very valuable. But then he says, but the heart of the wicked is worth little, is useless. So we have these two comparisons or two contrasts, something very, very valuable and something worthless. Again, it helps us understand what he is wanting us to know. And in that last one, <clears throat> verse 21 tells us what's going to happen when the advice is ignored. He says, first of all, the lips of the righteous feed many. If you follow my advice, you'll be able to feed many. But if you don't, you'll die for lack of wisdom. Here's what's going to happen if you follow my advice. Here's what's going to happen if you don't. Straight and to the point. And it is a marvelous way of conveying information. In a way you remember it. Uh, in, in a way where you have these images and pictures brought to your attention. So that you know what he's wanting you to understand. Helps you understand, so you can know the meaning, so you can accurately divide the Word of God. And again, that falls upon our shoulders. It's our duty to understand. And notice when we read this, how different this is than Genesis through Deuteronomy. They're written totally different. It's a totally different type of writing. Sometimes we call Genesis through Deuteronomy prose, where this is poetry. And you look at them and you interpret them very, very differently. Let's go on. Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> These all come from the 10th chapter. <clears throat> First of all, a couple of places in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 where the wise man contrasts who's wise and who's foolish. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 2 says, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. And now go down to verse 12. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool shall swallow him up. Now, in poetry, as you've seen, God uses a lot of figurative language. A person's words can't literally or physically swallow someone up. That's not possible. But it tells us what God wants us to know. See, a foolish man can be overwhelmed and destroyed by what he says. Why? Because he's foolish and says foolish things. But a wise man is going to, pro is going to prosper from it. Why? Because he's wise and says wise things. He's going to say things that are gracious, full of grace. And he's going to prosper. Foolish man, he's going to be swallowed up. Well, you know, we even use the expression swallowed alive. That's kind of what the wise man is saying here. And in verse 18, <clears throat> notice how these two thoughts complement one another and emphasizes the thought, verse 18, because of laziness, 
the building decays, and through idleness of hands, the house leaks. Notice the two descriptions, laziness, idle hands. And when you put those two together, you get the picture of what this person is like. Has no desire to keep things up. He's not concerned. He's not busy doing something else. His hands aren't doing anything. That's why he's called lazy. And we see this, this picture, this mental picture of a person who's doing nothing but watching the building decay. He's just falling down. Things are starting to leak. And is he doing anything about it? No. Is he concerned about it? No. But Hebrew poetry shows us and tells us and emphasizes to us how important it is for people to be workers in this case and not be lazy and not have idle hands. And the more you study it, the more amazing it becomes. In the Song of Solomon, there's a few places there. <clears throat> Chapter 4, verse 7 is a beautiful example of this, these parallel thoughts. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 7. You are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. And of course, this is between, you know, a husband and wife. And probably most of Song of Solomon is about newlyweds. And here he's saying what? There, there's nothing, there's no spot in you. And, and he says, you're so fair. And so that's the, the comparison he's making. And you find that throughout the book. And, and it's a beautiful book. If you haven't read Song of Solomon in a while, it is a, a beautiful, beautiful book. In chapter 8, <clears throat> verses 6 and 7, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Boy, we get this mental picture coming. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. What an amazing picture of the love between a husband and a wife. See, that's not... That's not prose. If we were writing it in prose, we'd say something like the wife is very much in love with her, <laughs> her husband. But Hebrew poetry emphasizes in, in these mental pictures and this figurative language uh, what he wants us to understand. Again, the meaning of this. And the meaning here is the, the wonderful love that's supposed to be between husband and wife regardless of how long they've been married. Again, it's uh, the, the, the husband, uh, the wife, they're just, they, they are so much in love throughout this book. And then lastly, the book of Job, real quick. I don't have time to go over all of them, but <clears throat> a few of them in particular. <clears throat> go to Job chapter 8. There's two there I want to look at. Job chapter 8. Verse 3, here's an example again of this parallel thought. Does God subvert judgment or does the Almighty pervert justice? And of course he doesn't. But it's the same thought, but when you put them together, you get a, a, a clearer picture. Your understanding is enhanced of what we're supposed to get from that. What is God like? Does God ever pervert justice? No. He never perverts. He never abuses justice. He is perfectly just in every single thing He does and has ever done or will do. In that same chapter, go down to verse 9. <clears throat> For we were born yesterday and know nothing because our days on earth are a shadow are a shadow. We hear, we, we hear similar terms uh, 
about life being a shadow. You know, it's fleeting, it's here, and, and it's gone. But think about the way God chose to tell us in those verses. And then in Job chapter 11, and we'll be done. Job chapter 11. <clears throat> First of all, verse 7. Job 11, verse 7. Can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? Can you do that? Of course not. God is so infinitely higher and more powerful and more knowledgeable that there's no way people can search out the deep things of God. And then notice how he, how he puts it together with, can you find out the limits of the Almighty? No, because He's infinite. He's infinite in power. He's infinite in holiness. He's infinite in justice. He's infinite in knowledge. You can't search out His limits. There's no way. And then in verse 12... <clears throat> One of my favorites, I saved it for last. Job 11, verse 12. For an empty-headed man will be wise when a wild donkey's colt is born a man. What an incredible picture that paints. There's Hebrew poetry. What a picture. Is an empty-headed man ever going to be wise? No, because a wild donkey's colt is never going to be a man. Hebrew poetry is, I've had a chance to study this for about three or four weeks. I've been putting this together. It's just one of the most incredible styles of writing. And it's so different than English poetry. It's so different than English poetry. And, and frankly, I like it much better than English poetry. Because it enhances understanding and meaning and it provides information. That's the way the words and the thoughts are arranged is so that some thought or principle is emphasized and it's emphasized in a way that we can picture it and remember it and it enhances our understanding. That's why I love Hebrew poetry. And it, knowing it and understanding how it's written can be a tremendous benefit in interpreting various texts in the Old Testament. Going back to what I said at the very beginning, each of us are called to be the best Bible students we can be. And we have to be the best Bible students we can be so we can rightly divide the word of truth. We can handle it correctly. Some people take things from these, these Hebrew poems and, and turn them into things that they were never meant to say. So again, our responsibility to be the best Bible students we can possibly be in. That was the purpose of the lesson. We can go back now and reread re Job, reread some of the Psalms or Proverbs with these thoughts in mind and I think not only be better students but come to know God better and His Word better and be able to apply these things in a much better way than ever before. Well, I know this has not been an evangelistic lesson in any way. We certainly want to offer uh, this invitation that, number one, if you have reached that point in your faith where you are ready to confess and be baptized, then we encourage you to do that. Or if you need to ask for the prayers of the congregation, Whatever the need may be, we encourage you to come as we stand to sing this invitation song.